Hello friends, welcome again. I'm Tanvir Atsi. We'll be discussing modern Indian art and the idea of indigenous contemporary. As we have been discussing the notions of modernism, the cultural foundations that ultimately shape the idea of modernism, the artistic moments that are associated with the modernism. And in Indian context, we saw the rise of modernism in the early 20th century during the colonial rule in India. Now, in this lecture, we'll be talking about multiple ideas, multiple strands. What do we mean by indigenous? How was indigenous perceived by the Indian artists? What do we mean by contemporary? How was the idea of contemporary looked at by the Indian artists as well as theoreticians? My motto also in this lecture is to acquaint you with the theoretical considerations and the problems of Indian art historical discourse in order to propose parallel frameworks or new frameworks. Do we still consider the Western notions of art after 20th century when we have come to 2015? More than 100 years of modern art in India with the ruptures and changes it underwent, with different movements, initiatives initiated by the collectives, the discourses that are being put play that are, the discourses that have been put into place, the methodologies, the prisms, the perspectives, the vantage points from and with which Indian art has been put into theory by the scholars as well as art historians. And to these theoretical deliberations, how did the contemporary artist of India respond right from the inception of modernism in India? I will also be hinting at a possible methodological approach where we will identify the problematics of Indian art historical discourse. At the same time, as I said, we'll try to forge a dialogue will try to propose an alternative conceptual framework to look at the Indian art from an indigenous perspective. Now, when we see Indian art in the beginning, in the early 20th century, when the Victorian nationalism we have been talking about in previous modules was in vogue, and a new kind of sensibility was instilled and propagated by the British art enthusiasts and theoreticians, including the artists who visited India. And then when Indian artists felt the need of identifying themselves as the hires of Indian artistic tradition, rebelled and revolted against a vocability that appeared at certain junctures alien to them, and also with which they found new, they found no or less connection. Now here, again when we look at the discourse of art history in India, with the advent of 19th century colonialism in India, the 19th century art history also was extended to the subcontinent. The foundations of art history as a discipline as a stand-alone discipline were laid down by German art historian John, Wilkemer, John Winkelmann in 19th century. Winkelmann exactly looked back to his predecessor Vasari of the Renaissance times who, who had written biographical accounts of the artists and architects who were active during the period of Renaissance in Europe especially in Italy. These foundations leave no scope, no, these foundations leave no or less scope for the incorporation of narratives that fall out of the ambit of European notions of art. Now, how do we classify? How do we write down the history? Or how do we look at the Indian artistic practice 
when one talks about art in the realm of history is a question that we'll be dealing with right now. Unlike the West, where the history of modernism is seen in conjunction with avant-garde, the non-Western modernisms which were imposed on the countries Britain colonized to implement a Eurocentric, essentially Victorian, cultural criteria to value the other cultures require different frameworks and perspectives which do not necessarily see them as linear, monolithic and completely a Western phenomena. It's not easy to plot a straight line from 19th century to what became known as Indian modern art and its projection in the cultural map of the world, unlike we do in the West. From 19th century onwards, art history homogenizes the artistic practices by drawing a straight line from enlightenment to modernity. It's not possible in India because of the cultural as well as the social diversity. Historians of art and culture are yet to equip us with the conceptual frameworks with which one can approach the domain of modern Indian art to explore and reconsider the circumstances and developments that encouraged and provoked Indian artists to look back at their own traditional practices and come up with alternative ways of responding to a selective idea of modernization, which was embedded deep within the bourgeois ideology of the colonizer, the British. The evolution of modernism in India immediately and essentially tinged itself with nationalism in the late 19th and early 20th century, which defined the tradition as a resistive approach for decolonization to set the claim for contemporary, which we see in the art of Abhinendranath Tagore, which we see in the art of Nandalal Bose, which we see in the art of Jamini Roy, and so on and so forth. Needless to point out the paradox here. The role model for this revivalist gesture was the idea of European Renaissance. And rediscover the idea of identity and project it on the world cultural map, the European artist of Renaissance looked back at the Greco-Roman artistic traditions for the source of inspiration. Similarly in India, after 200 years of colonial rule, in which India too had gone, India too had undergone a tremendous cultural hiatus. A lacuna was created, a void existed, a cultural void existed, which was demanding to be fulfilled with expressions and idioms that could bridge the gap between the modern and the ancient artistic traditions in India. But what segregates, differentiates post-Renaissance Western realist artistic tradition from that of Indian artists who were heirs of several artistic traditions is the assimilation of Western modernism and the traditional artistic dynamics which ultimately resulted which ultimately resulted in a double-edged manner. The traditional Indian artist set to claim an individual modern identity for themselves and reconsider the ways traditions were looked upon. But ironically, we are yet to liberate ourselves from this double edict of colonial hangover in terms of the historical narratives.
That is to say that historians of art inform us that until 19th century, the cultural hegemony of the West had not found its feet within artistic traditions of India. It was struggling to come to a consensus with the Indian artistic traditions in order to reconcile with the vocabulary that was alien to it. The aesthetic sensible of the West was until then received with a scant interest by Mughal court painters of 16th century. Western academic style of painting was adopted as a contributing factor to the Mughal style of painting, which only borrowed certain aspects of it. With the establishment of their rule in India, and in order to establish and impose an aesthetic hierarchy, the British colonizers transformed the hitherto non-hierarchical relationship of India and the West into a hegemonic one. Their aesthetic principles, however, had emerged and transformed the religious image of the West into an art object with the advent of museum in 18th century. As historians, critical, as critical discourse of art history in the West, which has surfaced for over the last 20 years, tells us that before the 19th century, when the principles of aesthetics were laid down by Baumgarten, there existed nothing to be called as art. The debate around the image of art was entirely based on the religious narratives. Therefore, their art was merely a century old when they came to India. But just to remind you again, that it was not British who were exposed to modernism themselves. They were still practicing Victorian realism in their art. They however succeeded in disseminating their notions of art in countries. They ruled where they found suitable takers like Ravi Varma in India who proved instrumental in transforming the traditional Indian art into a new idiom which was not at the same time devoid of so-called Indian motifs. Because essentially what Ravi Verma did is that he took the epics like Ramayana and Mahabharata and transformed them into his paintings which were essentially done with Western academic realism. Verma combined the language of art with Indian subject matter, mythology particularly, and inaugurated a new era of in modern Indian art. A new era of Indian art. What Ravi Verma, however, did succeed in was exposing and bringing forth, shedding light on the rich literary tradition of India, which included the unparalleled epics like Ramayana, Mahabharata, and so on. He deliberately chose these subjects. Interestingly, because these characters were identified by every, by the people irrespective of caste, class, or gender. And this was the mentality that Ravi Verma understood to take advantage of and propagate a mythological visual vocabulary that at the same time was in tandem with British ethos, British notions, Victorian notions of naturalism. Ananda Kumar Swami and Kokuzo Kokora, Indian artists followed the footsteps of Raja Bhavi Verma. The Western realism and the art continued to be a mirror image of Western academic painting. Kokuzo Kokora, 
Anand Kumar Swami and E. B. Hevel were extremely interested in the rich artistic heritage of India and realized that Indian artist needs to go back and subscribe to the traditional idioms of painting and sculpture in order to derive inspiration which could be which could at the same time suit his sensibility and with which his people the audience would find a connect the trio instilled a new sensibility of tradition and continuity among artists a revival of traditional elements of art to solidify a nationalistic identity gained certain momentum under the supervision of these gentlemen. This fervor prevailed till very late, producing stalwarts like the three Tagores, about who we discussed at length in the previous modules, who were followed by a chain of disciples. Till 1960s, the question around identity politics, aesthetics, tradition, revival, and indigeneity had gone through certain ruptures. It was discussed, ideas were churned, there were rejections, there was acceptance, there was revolt, there was resistance. From the artist and intellectual fraternity of this country, across India, who debated and disputed, expressed and disagreed with ideas that were being put in place, challenging every step taken towards a creative guideline. The question of identity had taken a new turn with the partition of India. As we saw with Dili Shilpi Chakra, the displacement, grief, pain, suffering had created a considerable amount of impact on the minds of artists of India. But what it did was something very essential. That with the partition of India, now India had to redefine again its identity. First of all, as a country on the world cultural map, and secondly, as a democratic country. A new set of questions around Indian modernism gained momentum. And the proponents of this ideology this time dispensed with the nationalistic notions of their predecessors and instead focused on conceptual frameworks which they proposed should be derived from traditional artistic practices. A new notion of international art with indigenous character began doing grounds in the artistic and intellectual circles of India. Artists began to move from their earlier styles to new expressions which were firmly embedded in their cultures. Two of the foremost proponents of this ideology were painters G. R. Santosh and Berante. These two painters, unlike their predecessors and contemporaries, carved a new way out for them. They went into the spiritual traditions of India. Let's have a look at Santosh's life. As an extraordinary artist, Santosh's contribution to the world of Indian art is unparalleled. But the beginnings of his career as an artist were very humble. Let's have an overview of Santosh's evolution as a tantric painter. Not many within and outside the bounds of art field would know that Santosh was his beloved wife's name. His family given name was Ghulam Rasul Dar. Born in 1926 in a materially humble family in Srinagar, Kashmir, 
Santosh very early displayed a profound talent for figurative art. To secure his bread and butter, Santosh learned paper mache in the rich environs with skilled artisans. He also tried his hand in signboard painting to earn a life. Then by the dint of sheer hard work, he made it to Baroda for further training under the famous NS Bendry at the infamous MS University Faculty of Fine Arts. In the beginning, Santosh painted in cubistic and impressionistic styles. Those were the styles which he inherited from his master, Bendre. His paintings depicted landscapes and townscapes with quaint houses and the little narrow lanes of his native town, Srinagar. Looking at his artistic journey from 1957 to 1964, a straight line could be drawn marking the years of growth of a self-imposed discipline and apprenticeship. From impressionist to cubist and then a naturalist, naturalist, Santosh appears to be a restless artist in search of an individual style and subject for his artistic expression until he reaches to a point which he then explored throughout his life as an artist. To quote Santosh, to he quote says, Santosh, he says, I did a series of drawings wherein man and nature mingled, even formally as a unified image concept, which I suppose could serve as a link. It's true, however, true, however that something significant happened to me during 1965, which was partly of a spiritual nature and partly as a result of my awareness of art both here and then in the West." Unquote. If one is to divide Santosh's life into phases, three phases could be suggested. The initial phase, as discussed above, was a result of his mentor's influence on his work. The middle phase where Santosh tried to dispense with the impressionistic and cubistic styles of painting and moved towards his new tantric phase. During this phase, the elements in his painting had more breathing space than before. They had moved to enter. They have moved to the center of the canvas. The color scheme was very simple and comparing to his early phase, Santosh had restrained his palette to very few colors. Sometimes not more than two. His later phase saw an extreme upsurge of geometric constructions which you can see on your screen in his paintings. In his third phase, Santosh began by creating geometric arrangements in his paintings. His early geometric shapes had direct resemblance with male and female bodies interwoven together. Gradually, his painted surfaces started appearing more populated and the geometric construction began to look more elegant, transcending the figurative semblance to a more expressionistic, abstract painting. Instead of focusing on formal and optical explorations, Santosh transformed his canvas by intermingling of triangles elaborations of triangles into hexagons, complicated expansions to develop equilibrium and balance in an ingenious manner to create an infinite web of formal configurations. The development of perpendicular, flat, slant, spherical movements to create a set of lines and forms that establish all the inert and kinetic sequences in the geometric configurations and designate them as formative quality of a united organic whole in a variety of color schemes. A momentous creation of his inner eye. The forms of his art are the forms of his consciousness and aspirations, his actual qualities as a painter, his sensitivity of geometric construction, his sense of color and form have always been superb. His qualities as a painter and the harmony with which he executed his colors and forms remained unmatched throughout his lifespan as an artist. Santosh as an artist thinker belonged to a generation of artists who questioned 
the concept of modernism and progress and therefore distanced themselves from revivalist concepts and stressed on the notion of contemporary. For them, the idea of contemporary would essentially entail indigenous characteristics. They were vocal proponents of what in recent terminology could be called as the idea of glocal. The combination of global and the local. For them, the Western model of art had not proved a vital source of Indian avant-garde. Santosh's approach to art echoed this concern in its entirety as above statement underscores it also. Berende, born in 1926, is commonly known as a tantric painter, although he disagreed with this observation and refused to consider himself as a cult painter. His essential objective in his art was to discover the true nature of things, of self-realization and identification with the nature. His paintings possess a visionary quality in terms of transcendental concept of life. The forms are based on the principles of radiation, multi-petaled, flower-like forms in their myriad manifestations. They are the images of energy that activate life, rendered in brilliant glowing colors with a wonderful sense of compositionality. Berende's paintings are images of metaphysical introspection that helped him discover the intensity of light within him and establish his aura with it as an experience which he wanted to share with others. He conceived light as the nucleus, the matrix. It spreads, shoots and radiates but invariably returns to the core, to the pivot. There aren't many, there aren't any easily visible elements in his works. There are no symbols except perhaps the lotus or the bursting seed. But then the unknown cannot be expressed in terms of anything known, in terms of stock imagery, in terms of something that could be perceived easily. Perende is not a mere documentalist as some suggest, nor does he escape into a state of fantasy. Rather, he eschews both and tries to give a pointer towards a more coordinated human existence in an effort to discover the truth of things. To quote a writer, Baron had once stated about his own work thus, my paintings I believe are organic examples of the total me, of what I am and what I would like to be. A continuous striving and therefore a struggle to put the shattered pieces together and make a composite whole. My guideline is oscillation between two points, between the piece of a graveyard and the piece of the center of the sun. Either way, there is no end, no finality. It's a journey towards a possible, it's a journey towards a possible efflorescence through finding feeling, knowing and being the diamond core of energy within and within and the energy all around us. A simultaneous implosion, explosion of perception, it's touch and come touch all the way. A process of heart resistance and slow but sure acceptance, a process that hopefully will lessen the gap between the two points with the passage of time until it is time for a total surrender to and merger with it. Light, energy, God, a state of compassionate consciousness, I don't know. How one should describe it, this is to me, this to me seems to be the challenge. Isn't it the same for everyone? Now, looking at these two artists' ideas and the concepts they're putting forward, the question remains, 
The question that one could ask is that are the frameworks are the, are the art historical frameworks capable enough of giving us insights into the labyrinthine and complex web of ideas that these two painters, Santosh and Berende, propagated? The frameworks with which art historical discourses have approached modern Indian art, it's true, have largely so far remained informed by 19th century art history which has ranked the non-Western modernisms, according to the notion of progress, placing Western art on a high pedestal as a role model for the other modernisms. Its methodologies have stressed on the stylistic affinities and influences of other modernisms with that of European concept of modernism. One of the major problems that has plagued the study of modernism in art in general has been its falling back on Vasarian model of art history with its rectilinear and narrow framework which does not accommodate new discourses on modernism that shaped up outside the West. As you are students of visual art, you might find it interesting to look at the practice and the discourse together and see at what point they come together, they intersect together, they intermingle together to speak with each other. At what point does the theory of Indian art or the history of Indian art speak with the practice of Indian art? Therefore, once again, it needs to be reiterated here that to study modernism in Indian art, we need to look at it from a different perspective in order to formulate concepts that will address complex modernity and regional art practices in a broader context. With this approach, we'll be able to situate the issues of artistic production and construction of a regional national identity and pre- and post-colonial India with diverse cultural mixtures and transactions that have nourished them. This will also help us take into account the concerns and issues which artists such as Santosh and Berende and others tried to address through their language.